Thank you for joining us. Neuroscience is an area of great promise, and our guest today is Dr. Randall Kona. He's a Dutch neuroscientist and neuroengineer and co-founder of carboncopies.org. This is a research and roadmapping organization for advancing substrate independent minds. He earned his PhD in computational neuroscience at the Department of Psychology at McGill University. Dr. Kona is a former professor at the Center for Memory and Brain at Boston University and will update us on his research following these messages. The Life Extension Foundation is a non-profit institute with a 37-year track record of cutting-edge discovery that is light years ahead with medical breakthroughs. To learn more about the Life Extension Foundation, please visit ProLongevity.com. With us now is Randall Kuna. It's a real privilege and pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Not every day I have a neuroscientist to, to converse with, so I'm really privileged and happy to have you here, sir. Tell us a little bit about Substrate Independent Minds. Substrate Independent Minds is a, a new term that we're using to very clearly define the idea that what makes up a mind, so for example, the minds that we currently have, human minds, uh, is something that is a function running on top of a specific kind of machinery. The machinery in this case is biological, and uh, that you could take these functions and you could run them on a variety of different types of machines, basically. So that would make that mind substrate independent. Um, a common term used for the process of taking something from the biological brain to a different brain is mind uploading. And, and we felt that that was a little bit too vague. And so it's uh, better to talk about this objective of making a mind substrate independent. Fascinating. I apologize to our audience about the noise. We are here at the Doubletree Hilton in American Valley in California. and. There are people in the lobby nearby. Sorry about that. But let's continue. What you're saying brings to mind what Mr. Kurzweil has been stating, uploading one's minds. How does that relate to your research? Well, I've been interested in this problem for a very long time. Um, probably I've been actively working on it in one way or another since about 1994. And uh, I, I appreciate how Mr. Kurzweil is trying to explain to people what mind uploading would be and that we can look forward to a future where something like that is possible, although the way he describes it, it seems still quite far out. Um, personally, I'm interested in practical methods of getting this done, so how would you make a substrate independent mind? And uh, so I specialized in, in how to do that, how to make this happen, and the most feasible way of doing it is to try to emulate to replicate the structure and the function that's in the brain and that's what we call whole brain emulation. Um, another way to think about whole brain emulation is, is neuroprostheses or neuroprosthetics and uh, yeah we have examples of those today and, and if, you, if you were to do that for the entire brain then you would get this whole brain emulation. Good Lord, it is mind-boggling to consider how technology and research is rushing it forward and bringing new eventualities into reality. Unbelievable. Tell us a little bit more about the SIM, S-I-M. Um, I think it might be useful to explain, uh, for example, how, how it would be possible to create something like a substrate independent mind, how to actually do this. Um, so before rushing into any further details, I think it's useful to point out that we already have real evidence today that the brain can be viewed as a mechanism, as something that we can identify, that we can, using our reductionist scientific method, explore and replicate. 
And this is why I began talking about neuroprosthetics, because a neuroprosthesis is something that is supposed to replace a function of the brain, and to do so in a way that you can seamlessly keep on operating, keep on functioning, have a, a brain where everything works properly. Sometimes that would be used to uh, combat disease or dysfunction or some traumatic incident that has happened. Uh, most of the neuroprosthetics that we see these days are peripheral, things like a cochlear implant or a retinal implant. But there is one very special example that is far beyond those, that, that really works by having to understand what's going on deep inside the brain. And it's called a hippocampal neuroprosthetic that was developed by Ted Berger at the University of Southern California. This uh, hippocampal neuroprosthetic replaces the function of a small piece of the brain, in this case rat brains and primate brains, not yet human, but it will be a human trials in three to four years, um, where this hippocampal slice is really critical for our ability to acquire episodic memory. That's the memory of sequences, for example, us talking to each other and remembering what we just said. Um, if you lose that part of your brain, then that doesn't work anymore. He developed a chip that replicates this function of this piece of the brain. And that was done by observing what kind of signals were coming in at the input to that area, what sort of signals were going to the output, and simply treating it as a black box and then coming up with the function that explains the output in terms of the input. It's a very small area, but it shows that it's possible in principle and that it indeed works. So you can imagine that if you were to do the same thing, use the same procedure to develop the functions for all of the parts of the brain, that you could do this for a whole brain. Incredible. What are the implications with regard to Alzheimer's? Well, in a case like Alzheimer's, what happens is that you lose neurons and you lose synapses. Therefore, you uh, lose the ability to remember specific memories. Once the memories are gone, you can't get them back. So the only way to prevent Alzheimer's from having an impact would be if you, say, had a storage of your memory that was external to your brain or that was somehow captured before you lost the memory. Uh, using something like neuroprosthesis or whole brain emulation is not a cure for Alzheimer's. It is a way to create an alternative structure for the brain. So it's a way of offloading what you have in your brain. Um, if you had prostheses available or if you had already done the recording from the parts of the brain where you store your memories, then you could have that store and you could use it in a neuroprosthetic after you had had Alzheimer's, for instance. That would be one of those examples. So it would be in effect like having a hard drive backup of one's thoughts, memories, talents perhaps even, and then just uh, when you have some problem in declining health, you can just plug it in and all of a sudden, oh wow, now I know how to play the piano again. That is one of the possibilities. This is, for example, one of the reasons why Ted Berger himself is interested in that particular line of research. Um, ultimately though, the goal is even more ambitious. The goal is really to get complete access to everything that is going on in the brain because complete access is the only way that you can first of all safeguard everything that's there including your entire personality. It's also the only way that you can enhance what we're able to do. I mean imagine we are currently evolved to be well suited for survival in this epoch and in these kinds of challenges that we're encountering. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're, for example, perfectly evolved to live on Mars, or perfectly evolved to live in a vacuum, or 100,000 years from now, whatever other challenges may come. And to be able to move forward, to be able to deal with those kinds of challenges, to adapt, we need to evolve ourselves. We can't expect to simply be moved to the next evolutionary level because that's not how that works. Natural selection culls those things that don't fit. It doesn't move species from one niche to another. So uh, if you want complete access and be able to do this adaptation, the most extreme way of doing that, the one that gives you complete access, is if you can emulate the entire brain and get access to everything that's in there because biological neurons are not well suited for readout and writing. That's just not what they were built for. So ultimately the aim is that, to be able to become a species that is more adaptive and that therefore has a better chance at having some impact, at being meaningful in a greater span of space and time, let's say, than just this tiny little sliver of time and space where we evolved. I'm trying to remember who said humans are an evolutionary mistake. 
we are halfway from the ancestral ape to what must come next. It's rather amusing. But I'd like to ask you one of the other questions that we discussed earlier. How could we accomplish an, an entire simulation of the brain? How would that be done? Well, I want to make a distinction, first of all, between simulation and emulation. Because a simulation is frequently um, an example or a model of how a brain would work if we took an average brain, if we looked at the structure of brains, what they're typically like, or um, how areas in the brain are connected and what they do. Uh, this is, for example, what the Human Brain Project is trying to do. But uh, an emulation is intended to be a replica of a specific piece of neural tissue, of the part of the brain that you have, or of an entire brain that is yours or that is mine. If you want to do what Ted Berger did for the hippocampus, and you want to do that for a whole brain, you can't just look at the input and output to a black box that encompasses the entire brain, because there are just too many parts in there. You can't predict the function for how output become, is, is created from input and capture all of the latent function that's in there. What you need to do then is you need to break down this huge problem into a lot of small problems. And the way that you do that in neuroscience is you use this process called connectomics, looking at the connections between all the parts. Connectomics is looking at the structure, which neurons are connected to which other neurons. If you know that, then you can start treating individual neurons as those black boxes where you need to characterize the function that's there. You could get even smaller if you want to. You could look at ultrastructure in there. The point is that you need to get down to some level that is small enough that you can do what Ted Berger did for that hippocampal slice. Once you can do that, and you know how they're all connected, those pieces, then you can put it together into a brain. So that's where the, the main fields where work has to happen are, are in right now. That's the structure and the function. So being able to figure out what is the structure of the, all the connections in a specific brain, a specific piece of brain tissue, and what are all the functions of each one of those little pieces. So that's in vivo recording. And um, in the last five years, say between 2008, and, or actually six, seven years, 2008 and now, we've seen great advances in the connectomics area to the point where they now use electron microscopes to reconstruct pieces of tissue and make predictions about them. They can take a reconstruction of the retina or of a piece of visual cortex and tell you, oh, these cells, looking at how they're connected, these cells are sensitive to uh, vertical gratings or horizontal, because you know how in vision, we compose our vision from all these little pieces that specific cells are sensitive to. Um, and in the, on the functional side, uh, just recently with the Brain Initiative and similar initiatives, there is now a great focus on trying to get high resolution recording from lots of neurons at the same time. In fact, there's a group out of MIT, Harvard, Northwestern, and a few other universities that are working together who set themselves the task that is actually basically the task to do whole brain emulation, the task to record from every single neuron in a mouse brain at one kilohertz resolution. That's fast enough that if you have that kind of data, you can do the characterization for every single neuron in that brain. Looking at this and seeing how they're developing new protocols for getting data from the brain, and I could get into detail, but I don't know if we have time to get into detail about the various new types of uh, recording devices. But if you do that, and you look at the next five years of development, and if that goes just as well as it did in connectomics, then say by 2018, 2019, you could imagine that we could take something like a fruit fly brain. It's a very small brain. And we could do the connectomics for that. And we could do the recording of the activity for that. So you could start a project then to try to do the emulation of a fruit fly brain. Give that another five years or so and see what the results are. Improve that a bit. And at some point, you're so far that you can say, yes, we've created a neuroprosthetic or an emulation of the entire brain of a fruit fly. And then it's just a race to see that you can scale it up to, say, mice, primates, humans. What is the practical use of this research as you see it in the near future? Uh, well, there are so many uses for it. If you look at the parts that need to be developed, so the connectomics parts and the, and the recording from function, then you have uses, of course, in just in pure science, because you want to be able to look inside of brains and understand better what's going on inside of them. You have uses in medicine, where you can build neuroprostheses, like Ted Berger is doing, to help people who've had strokes in those areas. 
you can use that for uh, neural interfaces in brain computer interfacing, which is actually an area where I'm now active in a startup company as well, um, where you can help people to use prosthetic limbs or you can help people to interact differently with computers and so forth. There's also an opportunity to, to take that all the way to whole brain emulation. And at that point, you're dealing with a way that gives you complete access, the ability to enhance what we are, how we can think, the sort of things we can sense, as well as to live longer, because you can live in a variety of substrates and copy from copy to copy to copy, or to store it away and have backups and archives. So this goes all the way from helping with dysfunction, enhancing what we can do, to becoming basically independent of the, of the fragility of the biology that we're in. Speaking of longevity, uh, the co-founder of Life Extension Foundation wanted me to give you this book, the latest on disease prevention and treatment. Thank you. I'd like to ask you another question. Randall, you have a company called carboncopies.org. Tell us a little bit about it. Carboncopies.org is actually a nonprofit rather than a company. Um, it's the organization that I use to be able to uh, connect people from different disciplines that are working on things related to whole brain emulation that are required to put together, say, the structure and the function and build new devices and tackle with specific problems that, that arise. Um, so I do a lot of road mapping in that organization to identify the problems that exist right now, update that road map to see what is the next problem coming on as, for example, we're now dealing with high resolution recording, that problem goes away and other problems show up. Um, so this is about connecting labs, connecting people with certain skills, finding funding for them, um, and, and also telling people in the public about this whole new field and what's possible and where we're going with that. Um, I, I do that in a nonprofit capacity. Uh, and then on the other side, because as I just told you, uh, brain machine interfaces is one of the directions where these new technologies are going to be applicable and is in fact actually the area where rapid development is most likely to happen because people will want better technology, reliable technology, things they can use now rather than something that's coming up in 20 years. Randall, the research you're doing is so really essential. How can people support your research? Well, first of all, anyone who wants to know more about this should go to the website carboncopies.org because then you'll find every detail that you might be interested in and every direction that you might be interested in. Um, we currently have quite a lot of people who want to be volunteers helping out in one form or another. Um, to be honest, the biggest lack right now is, is a robustness in the organizational financing because what we do is interdisciplinary work and it's still very hard to do long-term interdisciplinary work. We can't rely on government grants for that because they're usually within a very specific discipline and we don't get uh, investor funding for things like this because there's no product within two years. Um, so really the best way to help, if you want to, is to go to carboncopies.org and look at how can I help. And there's also a donate button there if you want to help support our operations for the next year or two. Our discussion brings me to some of the subjects associated with this book. It so happens that Bill Falloon is the founder of Alcor and many of the proponents uh, of this are super interested in the prospects one day of being able to restore that person's personality and upload it into a computer or into maybe someone else. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite interested in that and I have a good friend, Ken Hayworth, who works in the area of connectomics, who himself is extremely interested in Alcor and in preserving brains and bringing people back that way. Um, one of the big issues anytime you're trying to preserve someone and bring them back is during the procedure uh, that they use at Alcor, is there anything that happens that causes a loss of information that you cannot get back? If you actually lose relevant critical information in that structure, in that brain that makes up the person and you can't retrieve it through the procedure you have, then you get what is called information theoretic death, which is a worse type of death than simply having your heart stop because you can't bring someone like that back. Now, a big question is, what is the best way to bring someone back from a procedure like the one done at Alcor? Well, you can 
focus on trying to revive people biologically, trying to fix all of the problems that exist in the biological body, but that means that you need to store the entire body and that your protocol is going to be focused on how best to preserve all of those organs, not necessarily how best to preserve the brain. The other option is that you focus on the brain as being the seat of our personality, the seat of who we are, and assume that we can produce another body, be it biological or non-biological, whatever you wish, and try to preserve that in the best way possible. Perhaps not even in the way that Alcor is doing currently, but perhaps some other method, methods, such as, for example, the plastination methods that are being used by people who need to preserve the complete ultrastructure of the brain for this connectomic stuff that they're doing in, in neuroscience. Right now, that seems to be the method that most clearly and completely preserves all of the information that we have in that structure. Um, so my friend Ken Hayworth, he's studying exactly this issue. He's got a brain preservation prize um, going on right now to study what is the best way to preserve a brain so that you do not have information theoretic death. And uh, it's not clear yet. The, the results are still out. Um, but to me it seems like if you can focus clearly on preserving the ultrastructure instead of having to worry about the rest of the body, your chances of not losing important things like synaptic connections or not losing uh, the exact structure of which neuron is connected to with that other neuron and things like that, you have the best chance of preserving the personality of the, who you are, of that part of who we are. Uh, and that, of course, then can be done in a variety of ways and involve the same processes that I was talking about before, except that at the moment when we talk about whole brain emulation, we still assume that we also have to do um, in vivo recording of the activity of the brain to make sure that we've captured the right response function of every neuron and things like that. Whereas in the future, we may know so much about these neurons that we can recognize just by looking at their structural connectivity, where they are in the brain, and the type of neuron that they are from the appearance of their morphology, what sort of a response we should expect. Um, that's not entirely clear yet whether we can do that, so we're still using both structure and function, but it may be possible to use just a preserved brain in the future. Science fiction becoming science fact. Fascinating. So what are your plans for the future? My plans for the future are to keep working on this until we actually have accomplished whole brain emulation and substrate independent minds and then we can enhance ourselves in so many ways and progress on towards other places and other times and maybe even understand each other better and connect better, empathize better. Absolutely amazing. For longer life, wishing you the very, very best. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you for being with us. Thanks. I'll be right back. Mr. Sami Zangi, the first patient in Israel to be treated with this new method, had suffered from shaking for 15 years. The name of his illness is essential tremor. At Rambam Hospital last week, for the first time in Israel, the first brain operation of its kind took place using focused ultrasound beams. The new treatment has been made possible through technology invented by the Israeli company InSciTech, an MRI machine, together with a special helmet that makes focused ultrasound beams. The MRI machine gives exact images of the brain, while the helmet sends 1,000 focused ultrasound beams deep into the brain. The beams zap the problem area of the brain responsible for shaking, Parkinson's disease, or non-stop pain. For the first time, doctors can treat shaking and pain by targeting the causes deep within the brain, all without putting the patient to sleep and without cutting. The operation was a team effort by three Rambam Hospital Department heads, Professor Menashe Zarur, Director of the Department of Neurology, Dr. Elana Schlesinger, Head of the Movement Disorders and Parkinson's Center, Professor Dorit Golcher, Head of the Neuroradiology Unit. Well, the advantage of this treatment is that you, you can get it without getting a hole in your head but you have the hole in the brain in the right place to have the, the, the desired effect. The patient got up from the MRI table on his own and tested if after 15 years 
Finally, he could drink on his own again and, of course, write. This concludes our special program for today from on location in Napa Valley. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.